What technological changes have you seen during your lifetime? By the time Edwin A. O'Neill died in 1954 in his 90s, he had watched Birmingham go from a village with a few hundred residents and a dozen or so businesses to a thriving city with a vibrant retail scene of over 300 retailers. A skilled leather worker, Edwin started his business in the 1880s by making horse harnesses, but evolving technology and changes in the ways people chose to get around pushed him first into the bicycle repair business and then later into the newly developed automotive accessories business. This is Birmingham Uncovered, a podcast by the Birmingham Museum where we are exploring the diverse and compelling lives that built Birmingham, Michigan into the community that it is today. First, some background on Birmingham. We are a city of approximately 20,000 people over 4.73 square miles, approximately halfway between Detroit and Pontiac in Oakland County. This area was occupied by members of the Three Fires Confederacy of Indigenous People before white settlement in the area started in the late 18-teens. Birmingham became a city in 1933 and today is known as a prosperous and multifaceted community with a thriving cultural scene. This is the first in a four-part series where we are exploring the evolution of Birmingham's retail environment in partnership with the Birmingham Shopping District. This episode, we are going back to the 1880s with E.A. O'Neill's Harness Shop and looking at not just the retail landscape of the village at the time, but also how people chose to get around. Edwin A. O'Neill was born in Ontario, Canada in 1862 and was the oldest child born to James and Sevilla Thompson O'Neill. We don't know too much about his early life, but in 1885, when he was 25, he immigrated to the United States and settled in Birmingham, a small but busy village surrounded by farms. Like a lot of folks that we've covered already, we don't know exactly why he came to Birmingham, but we do have some ideas. Remember when we talked about the Great Depression before the Great Depression in the 1870s in the episode on Robert Updike? This was part of a global recession that propelled many Canadians into the United States, particularly into border states like Michigan, Minnesota, and the Great Plains. Ontario, at this stage of its history, was still primarily a rural province, and if you wanted greater economic opportunities, you moved to a more industrialized or commercial area just like today. It is estimated that between 1860 and 1930, two million Canadians immigrated to the United States, with the greatest flow happening in the 1880s. Another reason could have been a bit more personal. In general, when given the choice, people would choose to locate around people who shared the same values and cultural background. Edwin's father, James, had been an immigrant from Ireland, And Birmingham, in the mid to late 1800s, had several families who had recently immigrated or were only a generation or two removed from Ireland. The mid-19th century saw a huge immigration of the Irish from Ireland due to famine and political instability, with many choosing to go to the United States and Canada. Perhaps Edwin chose Birmingham because he could hear familiar accents or smell familiar dishes, and maybe it felt like home. A third reason that we've covered on previous episodes was Birmingham's location and economy. Located midway between the industrial and commercial centers of Detroit and Pontiac along the Saginaw Turnpike, today Woodward Avenue, and it was connected to both and the neighboring areas by railroad, Birmingham had become the downtown for other rural areas and townships like Troy, Bloomfield, Southfield, and others. Primarily farmers from those areas came to Birmingham to buy, sell, or ship their goods by train, and their families came to Birmingham to shop, go to school, or visit friends and family. And even if a person utilized the railroad to ship or receive goods, the primary way for folks to travel shorter distances or to get from their farm or house to the railroads was via horsepower. Edwin brought an important and in-demand trade to Birmingham. He was a skilled leather worker and opened up a business selling leather harnesses for horses. 
just like today where every town has at least one mechanic, in the 1800s and early 1900s, you had a harness maker. Horses, like people, come in all shapes and sizes, and harnesses must be custom fit to ensure that the horse can perform at its best. An improperly fitted noseband on the bridle, for instance, can rub the horse's flesh raw, and aside from being extremely painful for the animal, can open it up to infection and even death in an age before antibiotics. A collar, fitted around the horse's shoulders to allow the horse to push rather than pull loads, can cause a horse to go lame very quickly if it doesn't fit properly. And just like today, if your car breaks down and you can't get to work, you end up losing money. If your horse went lame in the 1880s, you lost money and might possibly have to go through the expense of buying a new one. Having a good harness maker, like a good mechanic, was essential. Some ads for horses at this time include their specially fitted harness or collar for horses that were used for pulling a carriage, wagon, or plow, and or their bridle and saddle if they were a horse meant for riding. In the case of Edwin O'Neill, he primarily specialized in leather harnesses for horses pulling plows, wagons, and carriages. And that can tell us a lot about what the Birmingham horses were being used for. In particular, O'Neill's $15 harness was noted as being, quote, tough to beat. $15 in 1885 is equivalent to about $500 today. And even today, $500 is tough to beat when it comes to decent horse harnesses or really anything remotely connected to horses, for that matter. Horses, like all animals, can act unpredictably. Added to that, they are prey animals who are always on alert for threats. A horse spooking and running away from you in a field can be annoying when you're trying to catch them. But a horse spooking in an enclosed space can be dangerous and destructive. O'Neill would sometimes bring a customer's horse into his shop for the measuring and fitting processes and there was at least one time where a horse got spooked and caused some damage in his shop. The shop was originally located in a freestanding, one-story frame building. Between 1900 and 1905, O'Neill's business was changing, and so was his place of business. He built a brick building located at 108 South Old Woodward that still bears his name. So let's take a moment to talk about the changing economy of Birmingham at the time. What was the commercial landscape in what we now think of as downtown Birmingham? Today, downtown sprawls along Old Woodward for about six blocks. But in the late 1800s, it was still mostly centered around Old Woodward and Maple. And here, we need to clarify the different Woodwards in Birmingham. And yes, I know the constant distinction between Old Woodward and Woodward is annoying. It's annoying for me too. In the 1930s, the state wanted to widen Woodward to deal with increased automobile traffic on the roads. And the families and businesses located along Woodward resisted because they had already widened it once in the 1920s. And that had led to a lot of folks having to move or tear down and rebuild homes and businesses. So the state's solution was to bypass downtown Birmingham. This bypass was called Hunter Boulevard to distinguish it from the unexpanded Woodward Avenue that went through downtown. This was probably confusing for everyone that lived outside of Birmingham, and probably for a lot of residents too. So in the 1980s, Hunter Boulevard became Woodward Avenue, and Woodward was renamed Old Woodward. It's a whole mess, and I don't blame anyone for getting confused by it. I'm confused, and Edwin O'Neill was probably also confused by it. But the too long, didn't read version is that the Woodward that Edwin O'Neill knew in his business days is what we today call Old Woodward. Okay, but back to business. The 1875 Michigan State Gazetteer lists the following businesses in Birmingham which at the time had between 700 and 800 residents. We have about 10 general stores slash grocers slash dry goods, including Friends of the Pod, John Allen Bigelow, or Poppleton, two horseshoers, a hotel, a few barbers, a shoemaker, a tailor, two wagon makers, one combination furniture maker and undertaker, 
a hardware store, and one millinery shop. One of the few businesses that women dominated, and this one was owned by Mrs. L. T. Furman. In this listing, there was only one other harness maker. So there was definitely a market for O'Neill when he came to Birmingham a few years later. By 1897's Gazetteer, Birmingham has a population of 1,000, and the number of businesses has swelled with the population to over 60. Two of those businesses were owned by Edwin's in-laws. In 1891, Edwin had married Ava Blakesley. The Blakesley name was well known around Birmingham as Ava's father, George, owned a general store and later her brother Frank had a hardware store. Anne, George, and Frank streets in the southern area of Birmingham were named for Ava's mother, father, and brother, respectively. The Blakesley name is one that comes up often in our research here at the museum because they are one of those families that married into every other Birmingham family. I don't think any Blakesley has looked outside of Birmingham for a marriage partner, ever. Also, why don't we have combination furniture makers and undertakers anymore? That could be a fun HBO drama or even a sitcom. Ooh, maybe even a cute little Halloween Hallmark movie. In an 1896 photo showing the O'Neill Harness Shop, we get a glimpse at how not only O'Neill's business was evolving, but also American society. The photo shows four men in leather aprons standing in an open doorway under a sign reading E. O'Neill, Harness Maker, and surrounded by horse collars. But the window of the shop has a sign that reads, Bicycles Repaired. Let's talk bicycles, or velocipedes, as they were sometimes known in their early days. And we're not going to get velociraptors mixed up with velocipedes, okay? The first designs were exciting. But they were hard to get on and not very stable, with the rider perched high in the air over a large front wheel. These early bikes were also extremely heavy, made of solid wood and metal. The safety bike, with its two equal-sized wheels and lighter frame, made it easier and safer to ride, and it took the bike from the world of athletes and risk-takers to the world of the everyday person who wanted to feel the wind in their hair. Popularized in the 1890s, the bicycle appealed to all segments of society. In 1894, over 100,000 bicycles were manufactured and sold in the United States. Several years later, over 300 companies produced over a million bikes a year. The bicycle's popularity led to innovations like rubber air-filled tires, ball bearings, and differential gears that were later applied to automobiles. And many innovators in the 1900s, like Henry Ford and the Wright brothers, started their careers as bike mechanics. Bicycles were certainly easier and cheaper to maintain than a horse and carriage, and it provided additional benefits, like exercise, too. Women, particularly, took to the newfound freedom bicycling provided. A woman on a bike could go anywhere she pleased. She could go out and seek work, attend meetings at her local suffragist society, and she could even gasp go meet up with a romantic partner. And of course, wherever there are women enjoying themselves, a moral panic must follow. As fashions change to allow women more ease of movement behind the handlebars of a bike, for instance, skirt hemlines went up, split skirts and bloomers allowed women to straddle a bike, and even corsets changed to allow a greater range of motion in the torso. And women reveled in greater freedom. The moral arbiters of the day warned that unchaperoned bicycling was a slippery slope that would eventually lead to sex work, and that the act of riding a bicycle could damage or destroy a woman's reproductive organs. You know, those super delicate organs that can push out a 6 to 12 pound infant? Yeah, those will just shrivel up and die if you ride a bike. In downtown Birmingham, like elsewhere, the business of bicycles boomed, and Edwin O'Neill hired a man named Cap Huffman as his bicycle repairman. Cap earned the nickname Dandy because of how sharply he dressed. O'Neill's. Come for the harness and bicycles? Stay for the snazzy outfits. And there was another Cap in O'Neill's life and story. Edward Smith, the father of the late Hartland Smith, who helped start the Birmingham Museum's collections, 
bought a pony named Captain from Watkins Stock Farm in Birmingham, which was the only place to get a purebred Shetland pony in the United States from the 1890s to the 1920s. And yes, there will be an episode about it soon because I am obsessed. And he brought the pony to Edwin for a harness. Later, the pony was bought back by the Watkins and used for pony rides at Bablo Island, and then was later purchased by the Detroit News and used as a contest prize. By 1910, O'Neill's had adapted to yet another new mode of transportation, the automobile. In that year, about 500,000 of these new motorized vehicles were on American roads, and the industry was just about to experience an explosion of growth with Ford's Model T. By 1912, Ford was producing 300,000 Model Ts a year. There was also a wide variety of automobile technology available to consumers as well. While gasoline-powered cars were gaining ground and would eventually dominate the market, in the 1910s, they faced stiff competition from electric and steam-powered models. Steam technology, already powering the railroads that most Americans were familiar with, was considered a safe and reliable way to power vehicles. Electric cars were popular with both doctors and women as they didn't need to be cranked to start, like the gas-powered cars of the era. Many of these cars were open as well, which brought a demand for clothing and accessories to protect the driver and passengers from weather conditions, like the rain and cold, but also things like dust kicked up on the not-yet-paved roads. Woodward Avenue wouldn't be fully paved until the 1920s, and it was the first such road through Oakland County. O'Neill's responded to the demand and sold lap blankets, gloves, goggles, and long coats known as dusters that protected the wearer's clothes underneath. And not to miss an opportunity, he also expanded the line of leather goods offered. More transportation opened the gates for further recreational traveling and vacationing, and Edwin crafted leather luggage to meet the needs of any of these new travelers. By 1915, O'Neill still sold horse harnesses, leather luggage, automobile accessories, and repaired bicycles. But we also see automobile parts like tires being sold. In ads placed in the yearbook for Birmingham High in the 1920s, O'Neill advertised harnesses and harness repairing, trunks, bags, gloves, and mittens. In 1927, after 42 years in business, Edwin O'Neill retired and sold the building to J.R. Peck, who opened a men's clothing shop. In 1925, Ava O'Neill died. Edwin remarried in 1927 to Carrie Aldrich. He and Carrie were married until her death in 1946. Edwin himself died in 1954 at the age of 92. The life and business of Edwin A. O'Neill gives us a fascinating glimpse into just how much life was changing for the ordinary American. In 1862, the year Edwin was born, the Atlantic and Pacific coasts of North America weren't even connected by railroad. But by 1954, the year Edwin died, the nation was crisscrossed by a system of highways and freeways, which allowed quick and efficient travel around the nation by automobile. Horses had gone from an indispensable partner in transportation and farming to a specialized hobby. Social norms had radically changed as well. For example, trousers were acceptable women's wear in many situations, and very few would blink an eye at a woman riding a bicycle alone or being behind the wheel of a car. O'Neill saw firsthand the expanding of downtown Birmingham and its shift from commerce that provided agricultural supplies and basic necessities for residents and those in the surrounding areas, to a more upscale and luxury retail and commercial market. We'll talk in our next two episodes about the start and evolution of the department store in Birmingham, but Edwin and Ava probably shopped in the very first one, Levinson's. That store started out selling practical, everyday items and ended up with along with practical goods, items like leather bags, candy, and fur coats. 
The Birmingham Edwin O'Neill came to in 1885 was vastly different from the one he departed in 1954. 1885's Birmingham was a small village of less than 900 residents. Birmingham in 1954 was a city of many thousands, and, as we'll see in the rest of the series, it had a nationally renowned commercial district. The following info comes from a business mix analysis report created by the Birmingham Shopping District and can be accessed on their website, allinbirmingham.com. The Birmingham Shopping District, or BSD, was founded in the 1990s, and its mission is to, quote, to plan, promote, and support a vibrant downtown Birmingham experience for the community and visitors by engaging and leading a convergence of thriving businesses, property owners, and residents, end quote. As of October 2023, O'Neill's building still stands at 108 South Old Woodward. And just like when Edwin O'Neill first opened his business in 1885, the majority of businesses in Birmingham's shopping district are local businesses, as opposed to national chains. 71% local and 29% national. It's one of the many things that makes Birmingham's shopping district distinct from other cities nationwide and something that residents of Birmingham want to preserve. The breakdown of businesses is, of course, different from when O'Neill first opened his business in 1885. Today, only 6% of businesses fall into the drugstores, florists, and grocery category. And the biggest category of retailers in 2023 fall into the various apparel categories. And sadly, Birmingham no longer has any combo furniture, hotel, and undertaking businesses. Which is probably a pretty niche market, but I think we could attract the goth demographic if we brought one in. Free marketing idea for my friends at the business district. Today, Birmingham shopping leans away from the everyday essentials that folks came into the village to buy in 1885 and lean more towards the, as the BSD notes in their report, quote, higher-end, sophisticated, and experiential retailers, end quote, with at least 50% of the retailers in the BSD having a luxury price point. Join us next week for another story from the development of Birmingham's retail scene as we look at Levinson's department store and the lives of Gittle and Morris Levinson, two Jewish immigrants who brought not only a new shopping experience to Birmingham, but also laid the groundwork for an Oakland County political dynasty. For a full transcript of this episode and to see photos and other documents related to O'Neill's, check out our website. The link is in the show notes. For questions, comments, or episode suggestions, please feel free to reach us at museum at behamgov.org. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating and review as that makes it easier for other folks to find us. For more info on the BSD and to see their upcoming events, check out their website, allinbirmingham.com. The link will also be in our show notes. I'm Caitlin Donnelly, and thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Birmingham Uncovered. Special thanks to the Birmingham Area Cable Board for Peg Grant funding that made this podcast possible. Also, thanks to past and present staff of the Birmingham Museum and our amazing volunteers.